Okay, so first I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak about my work. So I'm going to talk about alpha proteobacterial genome evolution. So why uh, did I start to work on alpha proteobacteria? Well, the reason is that a long time ago, and we heard a lot about this from Michael Gray yesterday, Michael Gray, Ford, Doolittle, and Carl Voss did the sequencing of the ribosomal RNA genes from mitochondria from wheat, and they found that it was most similar to Agrobacterium tumefaciens. And Agrobacterium tumefaciens is an alpha proteobacterium. So about 20 years ago, it seemed obvious that if we want to learn more about mitochondria, then we should sequence some alpha proteobacterial genomes. So we did just that. And we started out and sequenced the first alpha proteobacterial genome, which was the typhus pathogen, an obligate intracellular parasite. And here you can see a really nice cup that my team made when this paper that we published in Nature in 1998 reached 1,000 citations. Uh, so in this paper, we show that the typhus pathogen have more than 20% pseudogenes, and at the time, this was really controversial. So I went to many meetings when people said that bacteria don't have pseudogenes, and uh, by now, of course, it's all well established, and we have done lots of work to look at this process of gene loss and gene death. And um, so for several years, we thought that this is the only thing that happens to obligate intracellular parasites. They discard genes and gradually become smaller and smaller, as John McCutcheon described very nicely this morning. So I thought that there were no duplications and no recombinations. And then a um, Chinese, no, a Korean group sequenced a scrub typhus pathogen, which is a really close relative to rickettsia. It was formerly called rickettsia suzugumushi. And this genome has more than 50% repeated sequences. So if you look at this slide, you can see the typhus pathogen at the top having only four repeated sequences, and then the scrub typhus pathogen, which is twice as large, and the half of its genome, one megabase pair, is only repeated sequences. So this was really astonishing, and it turned out that these repeats are gene cluster for type 4 secretion systems, and next to them are small genes for proteins like ankylin repeat, TPR, and histidine kinases, which are typical eukaryotic-like proteins. And it has been shown subsequently that these are, several of these are used to modify host cellular functions. So at this stage, I thought, okay, obligate intracellular parasite, they discard genes, they become smaller and smaller, and occasionally they go mad and duplicate like crazy. But there is no recombination. And then we started to sequence Volbachia, which is also related to Rickettsia. And here we found surprisingly high recombination frequencies. And Volbachia are maternally inherited endosymbionts of insects, such as, for example, Drosophila. And we have sequenced several of these genomes, and we have studied the recombination rates and show that there is essentially free recombination between strains within supergroups, even if they infect different host species, but there is very little recombination between strains of different supergroups, even if they infect the very same host species. And even more interesting, Julie Hutop discovered that Volbachia genomes may be transferred into the nuclear genome of their host, and she published this a few years ago, and we have now collaborated with her and studied Drosophila ananasi and several different strains from India, Indonesia, and Hawaii. And here we have tetracycline treated the flies, and then we sequence the whole genomes and map reads back to our Wolbachia genome. And here she has also done in situ hybridization, and we think that maybe 20% of chromosome 4 uh, represents Wolbachia genomes, which have also duplicated, and this corresponds to about 2% of the Drosophila ananasi genome, and it also explains the large size of chromosome 4 in Drosophila ananasi. So this was nicely shown here, I think, and uh, also it has been shown in several other systems that bacteria may actually transfer their whole genome into the host nuclear genome. So we have studied these, and we have studied other endosymbionts like Bartonella, and people have continued to sequence alpha proteobacterial genomes, and every now and then we have done a phylogeny, and then we have mapped the gene content to try to study the flux of genes and see how genes come and go in the alpha proteobacterial evolution. And our most recent attempt, we have looked at 71 genomes. So this represents about 250,000 proteins, and we have sorted them into 1,000 scope superfamilies, 5,000 PFAM protein families, and 25,000 protein families. 
And then we have mapped those families onto a reference tree and trying to infer the flux of these different protein families. And we found, for example, that we think that about a little more than 700 protein folds were ancestrally present in the alpha proteobacteria. And these represent about 97% of folds in each proteome. And it's mostly uh, pr protein folds that are related to information processes and energy-related processes that were ancestrally present. Then we have also protein folds that show a more scattered distribution, about 300 of them. So they represent a small fraction in each proteum, about 3%. But since each proteum has a different set of these extra protein folds, altogether they may represent about 30% of all distinct folds. So those could be transferred folds or newly evolved folds, or perhaps some of them are also false positives or false negatives in our inference methods. So altogether, from all these studies, I think we have a really good view. Now we understand quite well the evolutionary processes whereby the alpha proteobacteria evolve. And uh, during these uh, 20 years, despite all of this work that we have done and all this understanding that we have gained, there are still a few very basic questions that we don't really have come to a clear conclusion about. And since this is now a discussion seminar, I thought I should kind of bring up these questions for discussion. And one of them, who is actually the closest relative of mitochondria? And this was briefly touched upon in, in discussion of the previous talk. And despite having all these genomes and done phylogeny, this has been really, really hard to pinpoint one particular clade as the closest relative. So a few years ago, I started to think that maybe we are just looking at the wrong kind of organism. Many of the genomes that have been sequenced were selected because they were of importance for medicine or agriculture. And maybe there are many more bacteria out there in the environment that we have not looked at. And of course, the oceans were particularly attractive since oxygen started to rise in the oceans. So maybe we should look more at oceanic alpha proteobacteria. And what is present in the oceans, in the upper surface waters of the oceans, you have primarily bacteria of the SAR11 group. They have very small genomes, like the Rickettsia, so they have more than one megabase pair, small cell volumes, and they are extremely abundant. 30 to 40 percent of the upper surface waters consist of this SAR11 bacteria. So altogether, they it's been estimated that they represent about 10 to the 28 cells in the oceans. So this is probably one of the most, maybe the most, abundant bacteria um, on Earth. Then there started to appear papers suggesting that SAR11 was very closely related to Rickettsia elis and mitochondria. So I thought this was fabulous. My two most favorite organisms, they were most closely related to the most abundant bacteria in the oceans. And this sounded really too good to be true. So when we started to look into it, and indeed we found that it was too good to be true. So we have now published several papers where we show that uh, you know, this clustering was probably due to an AT artifact. So both of these SAR11 and the Rickettsia elis are very AT rich, and almost all other alpha proteobacteria are very GC rich. So if you don't correct for that, or if you use genes that are very highly AT biased, then you get them together. But if you do the corrections and select genes that are not so strongly affected by these mutational biases, then they come separately. So we have come to the conclusion that SAR11 is not related to the Rickettsia elis and mitochondria. And Martin Embley's group have done similar studies and independently come to the same conclusion. So then, is there something else in the oceans that is closely related to, to mitochondria? And luckily at this time, Craig Venter went out on the oceans and did his sampling. And luckily, this was in the old times when people did Sanger sequencing, so the reads were pretty long. So this meant that we could now start to do phylogenomics or metagenomic reads from this global ocean sampling expedition. And uh, here, each arrow represents uh, you know, uh, metagenomic reads that have been selected to cover the genetic diversity that we could see in this GOS data set. And as you see, that are pretty well spread out throughout the alpha proteobacterial tree. And then what we did was a jackknifing procedure when we extracted 100 reads randomly from this data set, built a tree, and then selected the few that seemed to be most similar to mitochondria. And we repeated this procedure 100 times, and then we did a tree with what we could find as the most closely related. And here we have a clade which we call the ocean mitochondrial affiliate clade, 
But even this clade is not extremely close related to mitochondria, so it's not closer than, for example, Rickettsialis. It's deeply diverging in the alpha proteobacterial tree, but it's not super closely related. So I would say that this question is still a bit unresolved, that we don't yet have a group that is very close related to the mitochondria. And maybe this is because there is no such group. Maybe it is because um, mitochondria have evolved so fast and accumulated different kinds of mutations that it's really difficult to find the closest relative. Or maybe it is that it is present and we just haven't found this bacteria yet. Uh, but now with all this metagenomic sequencing of many different environments, I'm sure that if there is a very closely related bacteria to mitochondria, it will be discovered within the next few years. So I'm really looking forward to all these surveys and repeated you know, phylogenies of, to try to address this, kind, this particular question. Another question that has been raised ever since mitochondria was discovered, the mitochondrial genome was discovered, well, is why do mitochondria have a genome? And this is something that we will continue to discuss during the afternoon when John Allen is giving his talk. So the human mitochondrial genome was published in 1981, and the first author was Anderson S. And unfortunately, this was not me. I think it's a good paper, so I would have liked to be the Anderson S, but it's not me. So as you know, this genome is extremely small, and it not only has few genes, but it also very, very compact. So even termination codons have been eliminated. So there has been an extremely strong pressure to minimize this, uh, this size. And the questions that everybody have asked is, why do mitochondria still have a genome? Why has it not all these genes been moved to the nucleus or discarded? And I haven't thought about this question for a long time until now recently. I had a postdoc coming into my group, and his name is Patrick Björkholm. And I said to him that I want you to work on mitochondrial membrane proteins. And then he said, I don't know anything about mitochondria. And then he disappeared to read up a bit on mitochondria. And he came back and he said, I, I have a hypothesis for why mitochondria have a genome. And I said, oh, really? And he said, yes, I think that mitochondria has a genome. Because if those genes were located in the nuclear genome, they would be transported to the endoplasmatic reticulum. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. And then I said, I think I remember that uh, Gunnar von Heine suggested something similar a long time ago. And uh, Gunnar von Heine is also from Sweden, and he was actually my thesis opponent. And I can remember that we sort of discussed this a bit in 1990. And, uh, and Patrick then went back to read Gunnar's paper from 1986, and then he came back and he looked really depressed. And he said, uh, do you know Gunnar suggested this hypothesis? 30 years ago, I hadn't even started in school when Gunnar suggested this. So in 1986, this is probably the first hypothesis proposed for why mitochondria need a genome. Uh, but of course, at the time, there was very little data available, and um, the mechanism for import into the endoplasmatic reticulum was not very well known. So I said to Podrick that you know, now, when we really know much better, we can actually reinvest this question and test this hypothesis. So transport to the endoplasmatic reticulum from embryon or proteins occurs with the aid of the signal recognition particle, uh, also called SRP, and I will now speak of it as SRP. So SRP rec uh, recognizes the signal peptide or the nascent chain, and then it binds to the signal peptide and arrests translation, and then it brings the whole complex with the ribosome to the endoplasmatic reticulum and then insert the membrane protein there. For SRP to, to bind and for the signal peptide to come out of the ribosome, the length has to be at least 120 amino acids, including the signal peptide and the C-terminal tail. And if it's shorter than that, then the nation chain falls off the ribosome before SRP binds. Now, it has been shown that essentially any hydrophobic segment can function as a signal peptide and can you know, attract SRP to bind and then drag the protein into the endoplasmatic reticulum. So we could now look at you know, what is the possibility or the potential for any protein to be transported into the endoplasmatic reticulum. So we could identify what we call the target zone for recognition by SRP. So here the insertion-free energy, dg, of the transmembrane domain has to be lower than zero. And we know that the length of the TMD plus the C-terminal tail has to be longer than 120 amino acids. So we have this red part in this plot, which we call the SRP zone. So now we can test. We started with the respiratory chain complexes, which, as you know, consist of both mitochondrially and nuclear encoded components. And if we look at the nuclear encoded components of the respiratory chain proteins, they are 
all of them essentially outside the SRP zone, which possibly the exception of SDHD, which is just on the border. It has a DGE of about zero, slightly below zero, and it's also relatively short. Then we looked at the mitochondrial encoded components, and um, 10 of them, 9 or 10 of the 13, are located inside this SRP zone. So they are potential targets, and some of them are really strong targets for recognition by SRP. The ones that are outside is ATP8 and NAD4. And then we continue to look at mitochondrial membrane proteins for which structures have been determined. And again, 49 of the 51 non-redundant uh, proteins for which structures are known and are encoded in the nuclear genome are located outside the SRP zone. And the two that are located inside call for ABC transporter. And uh, one of these have been shown to be mistarget to the ER in the absence of a mitochondrial targeting peptide. We also looked at membrane proteins that are localized to mitochondria with glean fluorescent protein tags. This is, of course, a more noisy data set, but it's also larger. And it has, we had more than 280 proteins, most of them from yeast, but also a few from humans. And here we found again that the large majority of these are located outside the SRP zone. We had about 30 located inside, and several of these had exceptionally strong mitochondrial targeting peptide, and a few of them are annotated as being you know, used in both mitochondria and the endoplasmatic reticulum. And also when we went back and look into the literature, you know, with this, could, this hypothesis could possibly explain previous observations, for example, of COX-2 in legumes, which is known to be transported into the nuclear genome. And people were surprised that the overall hydrophobicity of the nuclear copy was not really changed. But they did find that the hydrophobicity of the first transmembrane domain was reduced in the nuclear copy. So that would be fully consistent with this hypothesis, that it was reduced to avoid recognition by the SRP particle. Then what about all the extra genes in some of these genomes, like Recainomonas americana? And here I don't think that the explanation has to do anything with that, uh, that they are still there to avoid recognition by SRP. Bill Martin had recently a paper about the ribosomal proteins that they might be there because they're important for the assembly. And of the few others, I think there are possibly other reasons for why they are there or these transport machineries are different in reclinomonas than in humans and yeast. There is just one that seems to adhere to this general pattern, and that it's succinate dehydrogenase B5670, 60 subunits, SDH3. And here it has three transmembrane domains, and in reclinomonas, all of them have the DG values below zero. So they would be strong targets for recognition by SRP. Whereas in yeast, humans, and acantamoeba, there these transmembrane domains have kind of switched and they now have the G values above zero. So how to avoid SRP-dependent targeting to the endoplasmatic reticulum for a gene that is transferred into the nuclear genome? Well, they need to reduce the hydrophobicity of the transmembrane domains. They can do that. They can also reduce the length of the C-terminal tail or they can remove the hydrophobic segment towards the C-terminus. And we have seen examples of all these proteins, uh, all these examples in the proteins that we have examined. And of course, they also need to insert very strong mitochondrial targeting peptide. So in evolutionary time, probably the genes that are still in the mitochondrial genomes have been transferred many times into the nuclear genome. But for this to function, then, you know, some of these processes must have occurred. And perhaps for some of these proteins like COX-1, Cox it may not just be possible for their function to reduce the hydrophobicity or change the length of the protein. And possibly they have tried. And if everything fails, what to do? Then you just don't move. You stay where you are. So we think that this could be one reason for mitochondria actually still have a genome and why there are still a few genes retained there. And with that hypothesis, I want to thank the people who have worked in my group over the years, working on both endosymbionts and phylogenomics and SOR11. And I want to thank you for listening to my talk. <laughs>